Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Well, I'm so glad to look out there and see these brave souls here this morning. How many of you uh, did any slipping and sliding this morning? Yeah, well, I got to share before we get started this morning, I got to tell you this real little story. On the way here, I uh, was coming down, uh, getting ready to get on New Burton Road, and it's just solid ice around this backside by the police station. And I was coming up to that stop sign, and I put my brakes on, and I didn't stop. And sitting across the street was a Dover policeman and his cruiser. And I slid right out into the middle of the street. And the first thing that popped in my mind is, is he going to give me a ticket for failure to stop? And I looked up and he goes, go ahead. I received grace. <laughs> then when I got to the church parking lot, grace the second time. Because I looked down, and I didn't have my seatbelt on. And so he must have looked over, and I went through a stop sign, and I didn't have my seatbelt on, and he waved me on. God is good. <laughs> is he not? Amen. Amen. Today, my friends, and the reason is, let us pray. Father in heaven, again, I thank you for the opportunity to stand here this morning before your saints. And we rejoice today at adding another precious soul to your flock and Bob Eastman. I know he's going to be an asset to the Harrington Church. He already is, but now he will even have a greater mission to fulfill. I ask you to bless all those gathered here. And again, as I always ask, please strengthen me this one more time and help me to speak with the power and authority that you would have me to speak. And I ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And the reason is... The reason is, why do we do communion? Now, everybody in this room probably thinks, well, I, I know that. But, you know, the communion service is part of the Passover, which goes back even further than 2,000 years. It goes back thousands of years to Egypt, where the very first Passover was. Passover, because the angel of the Lord passed over those who followed the instructions of God that were given to Moses to give to the people. But what I want to do is I want to talk on a little five points about the original Passover that happened in Egypt. And I want to point out something in particular that to me jumps off the page that very often as Christians we forget. So this morning, and the reason is, one of the things that they had to do those thousands of years ago in Egypt, the first instruction was they were to kill a lamb. Now that's found in Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. The animals you choose must be, <clears throat> sorry, I'm having trouble reading that, must be males that are a year old. They must not have any flaws. You may choose either sheep or goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month. Then the whole community of Israel must kill them when the sun goes down. Now, we know that the lamb represents what? Jesus. Now, you see, that's why I'm saying we all, oh, I know that, Pastor Phil. We, we've been doing the communion service for, you know, 150 years in the Adventist church. We understand all this stuff. Yes, I, I know. But we're going to look at it maybe just a little different this morning. The instruction was to kill a lamb. And at the Passover 2,000 years ago, when Jesus instituted the communion supper, He was the Lamb of God. We understand that. We've got hymns about it. We talk about it all the time. Even John said when he, when he introduced Jesus to the crowd, basically, behold the Lamb of God that does what? Takes away the sins of the world. So the first thing they did of the five parts that I want to talk to you about this morning is they had to choose a lamb without spot or blemish, which was a symbol or representation of Jesus Christ who was spotless and without sin. And then they were to do what? They were to apply blood to the doorposts of the house. Now the blood represented what? The sacrifice, yes, but it represented the blood that was going to be shed. Christ's blood, the innocent lamb. This was an innocent lamb that they killed. And it was put on the doorpost to show that they believed. 
They had faith. Remember when Jesus said you need faith of a mustard seed? Remember, these people were slaves for 400 years. They are more Egyptian than they are the children of God. So it's a learning process. The first thing you've got to do is trust me. And what I'm telling you is, if you want to be free, if you want to be set free, then you need to put the blood of that lamb on your doorposts. And if you do, that final plague will not fall upon you. Remember, they've already seen the other plagues. They've already seen the power of God. But now the greatest manifestation of His power, the firstborn of every household will die if you do not follow these instructions to the letter. And that's very important for us. We cannot be saved except through the blood of the Lamb. Now those, that doorpost, guess what? It again was found in Exodus chapter 12, verse 7. Take some of the blood, put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the house where you eat the lambs. Not your neighbor's house, your house. You have to be covered with the blood of the Lamb. Point number three. Stay in the house. They weren't told, look, when the angel of God passes over Egypt, I want you to run outside, take a look, and see what happens. You see, that's what we would do today because we're all thrill seekers. Look at all the TV shows we've got now. Challenge this. Well, I'm on an adrenaline rush. Our young people are on an adrenaline rush. If you don't believe me, all you got to do is get an Xbox. All you got to do is look on your telephone. And I've noticed that your top apps on, I don't care if it's Google or who it is, is all about excitement and things that hold your attention. Our young people today, they look at something that's grotesque and terrible and they go, wow, awesome, man. Cool. Well, you see, there was no cool or awesome to it looking out that window or standing in the doorway. Get in the house. Stay in the house. Don't be looking out the windows. Don't be standing in the doorway, looking around, seeing what's going on. Get in the house. And as Christians, we need to be in the house. In the house of God. But too often, we're hanging out the church windows. Oh, we're in the church. But the other half of us is hanging out in the street, seeing what's going on, looking for them thrills. Now, those thrills might be men, might be women, could be games, could be TV, could be things on the internet we shouldn't be looking at. And it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not, you shouldn't be looking at it. You shouldn't be doing it. You shouldn't be ruining your marriage with it. And it's not just men. It's amazing. Women, women have the same desires of men. What? Oh, scientific. I just love it when I see these things they put out on, on the internet about the millions of dollars that our government spends to find out something that's obvious. Now, I'm not kidding you. Just a few months ago, I saw where study has been completed. Dogs like to chase cats. And squirrels. Hey, I'm from the South. I was raised in the country. I could have told you that and give me the money. Come on. We've got to have that excitement. We've got to have that adrenaline. By the way, parents, what are your kids looking at? What are they getting their excitement from? Have you ever wondered why? Now, now I'm going to turn a stone over here that's going to upset some people. I don't mean to, but I'm sorry. That's just the way I am. You see, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, everywhere, we've, we've started changing our worship service to jazz it up a little bit. It'll make more people come because we got to hold their attention. We got to hold their attention because you can't hold their attention. Why? Because we watch so much television. We're into so many video games and so much text and boom, 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 boom. And then those of you that know me know I don't like to text. I've had people say, Pastor Phil, all your texts are one word. Somebody will send me a text. Are we having church tomorrow? Yes. That's it. I'm not into texting. You want to talk to me? Call. I like talking to people. I go into a doctor's office and two people are sitting there talking to each other. I asked these two young people, I said, what are you doing? He said, we're talking to each other. I said, what's the matter? Your mouth don't work? Well, no, this way we can, yeah, I know what you're saying. You can sit there and make fun of other people in the doctor's office or something or joke around. I'm sorry. It's true because that's our nature. 
We don't want to talk. Let's text. But we have to do these things now in the church to jazz it up. We have to have these great big uh, open air gospel music things with, with pyrotechnics and fireworks going up in the air to sing the gospel to the children to get them to come. Is it a rock concert? Or are we going to hear a message? Or to be entertained? I'm sorry, I know I'm taking some people off. I'm sorry, I'm old. I've always thought it's the message, the message, the message. I know I use PowerPoint, but I believe a picture's worth a thousand words. But I don't want it sitting up there with rockets going off behind me just so you'll look at me. I'm hoping that what I'm saying makes sense. Stay in the house. We want to be titillized. See, when we look at that text, itching ears, we all think, oh, I know what that means. That means people out here listening. No, what the Bible goes a little broader than that. It's what we get involved in. It's what we got to do to make us even care anymore. All these pictures and entertainment. My goodness, folks, come on. You remember when you would go to a movie like Gone to the Wind? Oh, well, we're not supposed to go to movies, Pastor Phil. Well, Adventists do. We just pipe it into our homes now, where before we snuck around about it, now we can stay home and see it. And nobody will know, unless they're in your mailbox checking your mail. But yeah, we're watching movies. But I can remember when you could watch something that was beautiful, beautiful cinematography. A horse riding into the sunset. John Wayne going, yeah, partner. And you go, wow, what a movie. Now, 90% of the movie is FX effects. You don't believe me? Have you seen Transformers? You know what you got to do to be an actor? Stand in front of a green screen and just let all this stuff happen around you. None of it's real. Now they show you all these secrets where the whole time he was talking, there was nobody there. That's acting? That's acting. But it keeps us entertained. More and more action. I was looking at Disney the other day. I'm sorry, but I'm not a Disney fan anymore. I haven't been a Disney fan for years. I watch some of the shows that they've got for the kids on, on Disney. I'm going, are you kidding me? 11-year-old kids dating and making out and this is normal? It's not normal. And our kids are sitting there and go, to, I'm supposed to be dating. I didn't know that. Wow, they're kissing and everything and holding hands. And every, if you don't believe me, turn on Disney. Wait till the sun goes down today. Turn on Disney if you've got it. And check out some of those shows, those little, little kitty shows. I'm not talking about the cartoon ones. I'm talking about where the little actors and actresses. And then watch that every two to three seconds, they're laughing. I don't, I'm sorry, but is that normal life to you? Everything they say is a joke. Everything is funny. And, and these adults they've got on there doing all these stupid stuff. He, 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 ha, ha, ha. That's not real. And then we wonder, what's wrong with our kids? What's wrong with our kids is we as parents aren't doing our jobs. We want to be their best friends. No, I don't want to be their best friend. I want to be their parent. They've got best friends out there. I'm supposed to be the dad. That's my job. Stay in the house. Want to know where it says it in the Bible? Right here. Exodus 12, 22. None of you can go out the door of your house until morning. Stay in the house and be safe. Stay in the church. It ain't out there. It's in here. This is real life. Not what out, out, is out there. Number four. They were to eat the lamb. Again, you can't be half in the house and half out. You need to be in the house. You need to consume Christ. You need to be a part of His body. You need to take Jesus into your life. That's why you ate the lamb. It was to be a part of you. Jesus is to be a part of us. Not just on Sabbath morning and we check it out at the door. We walk in, we become Seventh-day Adventists. For the next three or four hours. And then when we go back out and we say goodbye to the greeter, we check it out just like a hat stand. No, we should take it with us. They were to eat the lamb. 
Here it is, Exodus 12, 11. Eat the meat while your coat is tucked into your belt. Put your sandals on your feet. Take your walking stick in your hand. Eat the food quickly. It is the Lord's Passover. They were supposed to be ready to move because God was going to act and He was saying, look, when I do this great thing, you better be ready to move. You can't be sitting around going, well, I don't know, i got to think about this. I don't know if the Lord wants me to do this. I know the nominating committee asked me to do this, but, uh, you know. And I know you all prayed about it and asked the Lord to guide you to a name, but it can't be my name. That's impossible. All of you, all seven of you on that nominating committee, or however many it is, all 14 of you, whatever, I know you prayed about it, but you see, I just don't see it that way. I'm not feeling this great power and prayer you know, to, to move ahead. Well, wait a minute. I thought if we all gathered together and prayed about something and the Lord led us to someone or to a name, the Lord has chosen you. I thought that's how it worked. It wasn't supposed to be a feely, touchy thing. See, if you're waiting for a feely, touchy feeling that you're supposed to do something, you're going to be sitting around for a long time until you don't feely and touchy anymore because you'll be dead. When God impresses your church family that you're the one, it's not because they're picking on you. It's because God's led them to you. Somehow that name came up. Wait a minute, what about sister so-and-so? What about brother so-and-so? Well, they've never done anything like that. Well, how about that? When's it going to be the first? How many of you have been out there looking for jobs? How many of you have heard this line? Well, you'd be great for it. You've got a degree in it and everything, but you don't have any experience. And the first thing that pops in your mind, how do I get the experience if I can't do the job? I mean, i got to start somewhere. Yeah, but it's not going to be with me. But I've got the piece of paper. I've, I've taken the schooling. I've got the education. But you have no experience. We want somebody with experience. Well, how do I get the experience? Find somebody that's fool enough to hire you. That's basically what they're telling you. How do you get the experience to be a leader in the church or a teacher in the church until you step out by faith and give it a try and let God lead you? Do you think God really wants to make a fool out of you? Or does God want you to be all you can be? And then to me, the fifth point is one of the most important of them all. If you had too much lamb for one family, you were to share it with your neighbor. Here it is. Exodus 12.4 Suppose there are not enough people in your family to eat a whole lamb. Then you must share some of it with your nearest neighbor. This is the point that we very often miss the most. The lamb was never meant to be an item for gluttony. It was never meant to be a gospel, a message for just a few. It was meant for the world and to be shared with the world. Each one was to get a portion, but not all of it. Christ is bigger than that. He didn't just come to die for the children of Israel. He came for the world. And if you have too much, if you've been blessed too much, share it. And that's where we as Christians fail. We've got our bases covered. My kids are here. They're in Sabbath school. My name's on the book. I'm in. I am blessed. I have a good job. I'm not laid off like my next door neighbor. My benefits didn't run out on January 1, 2014, like 1.3 million people in America. Thank you, Lord, that I've got a job. I've been blessed. I've got plenty of lamb in my pot. And I'm keeping it to make sure I don't run short. Or are you taking the extra lamb, the extra gospel, to your neighbor. That's Passover. 
That's the five important points. That today in the Lord's Supper, I hope you learn and take from here. It wasn't meant just for you. It was meant for the world to be shared. At this time, we're going to separate for the service of humility. Families will meet in the multi-purpose room. And then the men and ladies will go out to my left, your right, and go down the hallway into the men's and ladies' different sections.